We're ready. Cool. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Borders Committee, March 2023, 2024. My apologies. Uh, my name is Jesus Cedar Escobar. I'm supervisor for District 1 in Imperial County. I'm very honored and humbled to be with you today as the newly um, uh, appointed chair for Borders Committee. I've been the vice chair a couple of times, but I'm very honored to be your chair for this year. Um, even though I am uh, a Imperial County supervisor, uh, I relate to San Diego County because I've owned a small business here for well over a decade. I'm a customs broker by trade, so I know the border region quite well. I know the border infrastructure issues quite well, and I obviously know the social economic issues and the health issues as well. So I look forward to today's presentation on a couple of very, very passionate subjects, one being obviously the uh, the uh, Tijuana River, which I can relate to because we have uh, this thing called the New River, which is very similar in scope to what we have here. With that, I also want to acknowledge Mayor Paloma, and I'm looking for her last name, Aguirre, Aguirre uh, who will also be presenting, but she's sitting seated at the dais with us, and I wanted to acknowledge her. Welcome. I also want to acknowledge uh, my Vice Chair, Carolina Chavez, who is a council member from the city of Chula Vista. I look forward to working with her and all of you, along with staff, uh, this coming year. Welcome. With that, we will go into a roll call, please. Thank you, Chair. For South County, Vice Chair Chavez. Present. For East County, Councilmember Koval. Chair. The City of San Diego and the County of San Diego are absent. For Imperial County, Chair Escobar. Here. Uh, North County Coastal is absent. And for North County Inland, Mayor White. Present. Uh, Riverside County is absent today for the Republic of Mexico, Gilberto Luna. Uh, the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association is absent for Caltrans Roy Abud. Present. And uh, the San Diego County Water Authority, the San Diego, I'm sorry, the Southern California Association of Governments and Orange County are absent today as well. And that completes the roll call. We do have a quorum. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, could you help me out with logistics as well? Of course. Thank you. Uh, so please note for this meeting, simultaneous, simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish is available, and we'll be hearing remarks from at least one person in Spanish. Uh, interpretation devices are available for the members at each seat, and I'd like to ask an interpreter to briefly explain how this feature works. I'm sorry, I'm, to the interpreter, I'm sorry, I don't know what your first name is, but if you could please explain how the interpretation works. Okay. I'm sorry, we'll have, uh, I don't think we'll have be able to have the interpreter uh, speak. I don't know. Could you clarify, Francesca, just for uh, members in the audience and members listening at home? Okay, I'm sorry, we're gonna have the, okay. The interpreter should be okay. able to explain That's, how the interpreters work now. Thank you. Announcement from the interpreter. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll, scroll down to the bottom of your screen where the meeting controls are and click on the interpretation icon, which is a world, and select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app, like a cell phone or a tablet, then press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on Mute Original Audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Headsets are also available for interpretation if you're in the meeting room. Please check out a headset with the receptionist at the lobby. Aviso por parte del intérprete. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla, donde aparecen los controles. Después haga clic en el icono de interpretación, que es un globo terráqueo, y seleccione Español o Spanish. Si está autorizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, como desde su celular o su tableta, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio o silenciar el audio original. Y también contamos con auriculares disponibles en caso de que usted se encuentre en la sala de la reunión. Por favor, pida los auriculares con la recepcionista del vestíbulo. Gracias. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'd also like to review the uh, instructions for participating remotely. So for members of the public who are joining us on Zoom, if you'd like to speak on an item, please use the raise hand icon in the Zoom toolbar. When you're called on by Sandex staff, uh, you'll be able to speak for one minute. If you're calling in by phone, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Um, and uh, uh, if you're calling into the meeting and to press, I'm sorry, uh, press star nine to raise your hand to speak on an item and then star six will unmute you. Um, and all comments made today, either emailed or made live during the meeting will be made part of the meeting record. And thank you, Chair. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Francesca. Prior to going to public comments, I do want to acknowledge, even though there's no tribal members here present, I do want to acknowledge the harmony that exists between the land, nature, and its original peoples who have since endured displacement, persecution, and systematic oppression. We pay respect to the unceded territories and homelands of the 18 tribal nations in our region, the most in any county in the United States from four cultural groups, the Cumaye, Luiseño, Cupeño, and Cahuilla. This land has nourished, I'm sorry, and the Dieguinho, I skipped them, I apologize. This land has nourished and healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Sandai community, we acknowledge this legacy. We aspire to learn from indigenous traditional language and experiences in undoing the justices of the past. I understand others perceive me. Oops, that's my bad. And we share strong historical and cultural roots that unite us with all our neighbors. Uh, Non-agenda public comments. Um, do we have uh, public comments, Francesca? Thank you, Chair, we do. Uh, first, I'll ask uh, Truth to step up to the podium and then we'll go to Blair Beekman on Zoom. Step up or shut up. I'm really just here for Paloma. Hello. Nice to see you at the retreat. Too bad you couldn't stay for the after party, but don't worry, I hung out with Jack, kept them in line. Okay. This regional governance system known locally as Sandag seems to think it owns all devices and all people along with our freedom of mobility because Lisa Hebner said it's the Sandag region. I thought it was in San Diego County, apparently not. But that's why there's gonna be an expensive, expensive future world design capital plan because it's not about friendship. It's about consolidation of countries and the usurpation of local control and representation. It's also gonna cost the American taxpayers a few million dollars. Uh, there we go, let's see. Uh, and, you know, we have things like toll lanes to Mexico that only the rich can afford, uh, while we have, let's say, Imperial County suffering from toxic pollution from the Salton Sea, and then we have the pollution coming across into IB and other areas. I'd say priorities are obviously misplaced. So point is, if you guys serving as reps don't start repping the parts of the county that are the other borders, Riverside Orange, then you are failing as a rep and as a regional Dunce Cap board member. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Blair Beekman, who will be followed by the original draw. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman. Thanks uh, for the meeting today. Thanks for the words of the new uh, chairperson. I was just looking over uh, Imperial County uh, El Centro City Council persons last night, and uh, nice, nice that he's here. I want to have the same sort of enthusiasm about border issues. I really wanted to speak at public comment at the board of directors meeting today that as they're choosing a, a new uh, CEO. I hope he has the same enthusiasm and, su and support and, and good effort that the previous CEO had. I thought he was great with border issues, and I hope we can continue that with the new CEO. I'm sorry I didn't say that at the previous public comment time at the, C at the board of directors meeting. Hopefully, if I can say it now, I can pass it along. But it was just nice to hear the uh, chair here today and his enthusiasm. Something can work well. I think something will be working towards uh, to continue good border practices. Thank you for those great efforts. I think our final speaker on this item will be the original draw. You can go ahead. It's crazy to think that this is a border committee and we don't even address what's really happening at our border, the invasion that's happening because you want to do business with Mexico. Well, we are doing business with Mexico when we're, you know, trafficking human beings uh, from other countries and setting everything up so that they can come here very well organized. I mean, there's people all along the way. There's no question about where to go, what to do. And, you know, I mean, even Mexico is kind of staggering. I'm telling them to go back a little bit so that it's not such a bad increase on the, uh, you know, border patrol and whatnot. Um, but it's sad to think about that nobody wants to acknowledge it. Um, our money is going towards facilitating that. But these people are getting 
three meals a day, shelter, transportation, all on uh, the backs of the people that work very hard here. And nobody wants to acknowledge that there's a problem. And so in that, when there is something that happens in the nation, which it's already been happening, people are already being murdered. But when something significantly worse happens, it's going to be partially you guys are complicit in that because you're not doing anything to mitigate it. You're ignoring it blatantly. That concludes the public comments, Chair. Thank you. Any uh, committee member comments? Go ahead. First of all, I want to thank everyone um, for being here. And also, I want to take this opportunity to say how deeply honored I am to be part of the Borders Committee uh, alongside a good friend, Jesus Escobar from Imperial County, and a longtime friend, Hector Vanegas, and many, many, many faces from the border region. It's a deep honor for me, 22 years by national affairs, worked on both sides of the border, I am happy to see the agenda today and see that we're addressing such important issues and sub, such important and um, epic epic um, cross-border uh, bridges were built in, we're, in California. That's what we say, that we have uh, the most important bridge, the most important gateway to connect between Baja California and California, and that's the cross-border express. So I'm happy to be here today and happy to be the vice chair, serving as vice chair, and that is all. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Chavez. Uh, I will utilize this time to uh, welcome and introduce, even though she's not here present with us, our new Consul General of Mexico in San Diego, the Honorable Alicia Kerber Palma. She assumed her duties a few weeks ago. She owns a bachelor's and uh, master's and uh, I'm not sure if it's a JD or PhD in law. Uh, we do have with us our Deputy County uh, Council General Gilberto Luna, welcome. I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, I also want to report that um, it's very important that when we talk about uh, trade relations, we look at Mexico in as a trade partner, and it is currently our largest trade partner with uh, roughly $800 billion in annual trade. So when we look at the negatives of our border region, we also look at a lot of the positives from an economic, from a fiscal and for financial perspective, job creation, job retention, and obviously looking at this Cali Baja region as something that makes us all much better for it from a bio diversity, economic diversity perspective, and so much more. So I am really proud of, again, once again, serving this community. And I really, really am proud of the fact that uh, we live in such a privileged area with so much dynamic international trade. With that, I also want to, I believe we have a consent item that we need to move on to, but my sheets are all mixed up. Oh, here we go. Item um, two is on consent, and it is the approval of the minutes. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes, which are on consent? I'll make the motion. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, we do have a motion and a second. Francesca, uh, do we do roll call or we do um, the manual vote? Oh, prior, prior to, I apologize. Do we have any public comments on any consent item? Thank you, Chair. We do have a public comment on this item, um, and then we will take a roll call vote. Thank afterward. you. Um, the original draw, you can go ahead. Shoot, I thought you were going to skip that. Thank you for not doing that. Um, your regional tribal binational outreach and the whole world capital, uh, world design capital um, is keeping you guys, and, and the $800 billion that you get from Mexico is keeping you guys from acknowledging that there's human trafficking going on. These children get lost. They get lost, they get trafficked, they get their organs harvested, and nobody's paying attention because you guys are more concerned about the economic value of your relationship with Mexico and having the border be open and having nobody do anything about it. And when you're talking about the sustainable freight implementation, there's nothing that's going to be sustainable about that. It's going to significantly halt our ability to transport goods. So I don't understand. You guys, are, are you not talking to truckers? You know, if a charge from a truck only goes 125, 150 to 200 miles, you understand how far they go. That's not even like a drop in the bucket as far as like the amount of miles that they drive to transport goods. So you're significantly and severely hindering their ability to do that and our ability to get goods. No matter what way you slice this, 
it's not a good issue and thing and you're putting people in danger with all of the radiation they emit. Our next speaker will be Blair Beekman. Before, before we start, uh, I just want to remind um, any comments should be related to the specific item we are uh, working on. In this case, it's a consent item and it is the approval of the minutes. So please limit comments to a specific line item, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, right. next... Sorry, sorry, Blair, you can go ahead when you're ready. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Blair Beekman, uh, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Uh, the consent calendar today is only the minutes. You have about three or four other items uh, around Tijuana River Valley issues. Those are going to be regular discussion items today for clarification. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Then I will just simply wait until those items come up to offer public comment. Thank you. That concludes the public comments on consent. Thank you, Francesca. I do have, uh, do you have any board member comments? Say, uh, seeing none, uh, Francesca. Thank you very much. For South County, Vice Chair Chavez. Oh, sorry, if you could just state for the record, I. <laughs> yes, or no. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, for East County, Council Member Koval. Yes. Uh, the City of San Diego and County of San Diego are both absent. For Imperial County, Chair Escobar. Yes. Uh, North County Coastal is absent, and for North County Inland, Mayor White? Yes. And that motion does pass unanimously with those members that are present. Thank you, Francesca. We move on to item number three, Tijuana River Valley, U.S.-Mexico Transborder Pollution Environmental Crisis. I am uh, pleased to have Mayor Paloma Aguirre from the City of Imperial Beach joining us today. I look forward to your presentation, and uh, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Escobar and Vice Chair Chavez and members of this committee. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you for serving on this very important committee, as has been mentioned before. Um, I'm obviously not going to talk to you about North County District <laughs> Homeless Impact Transit Service. A little technical difficulty um, there, I apologize. But in the meantime, um, you know, I'll start with a little bit of overview and background on what the issue is uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the cross-border pollution crisis. So the pollution crisis stems from the fact that we share a watershed with Mexico, the Tijuana River watershed. Three quarters of it are in Mexico, one quarter in the U.S. It spans about 1,800 square miles. And it's a seasonal river, which means it only flows when it rains. But when it doesn't rain, it has the ability to carry up to a billion gallons of water per day. Now, since uh, NAFTA was first signed back in the 90s, uh, we foresaw there being negative externalities related to free trade with um, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And that was one of the primary reasons that... Um, attracted a lot of people seeking jobs in the city of Tijuana. Yeah. So the population of the city of Tijuana has now grown and it's grown over a, an infrastructure system that is insufficient to cater to as many people as the city of Tijuana now is comprised of, which is getting pretty close to 3 million now. Um, in addition to that, the geographical characteristics of the city are such that it sits on average 300 feet above sea level. So when you have insufficient stormwater capacity, insufficient sewage infrastructure, and insufficient trash collection services, every time it rains, all of that waste and sewage and stormwater drains down across the border into the Tijuana River, which is the main stem of the system, and several other smaller tributaries flowing into the federally protected Tijuana estuary and ultimately into the coast just south of Imperial Beach. Thank you very much. Is this the right one? Yes. Um, so we have impacts as far south as Rosarito, Baja California, and as far north as Point Loma, which is well 
north of the city of Coronado and Silver Strand State Beach. So as I mentioned, this is a picture of Imperial Beach. You can see the pier, you can see the river mouth, and that plume of pollution, as I mentioned, can extend as far north as Point Loma. So our city has experienced over 820 consecutive days of beach closures. Our jurisdiction extends uh, all over the estuary, all the way to the border wall. So we actually share the border wall with Mexico. A lot of people don't know that. Um, so that stretch of beach has been closed basically over two years. So it's an um, incredibly um, concerning coastal access issue. It also has environmental impacts, obviously economic impacts, but most importantly, the public health impacts, which you will hear from Dr. Granados a little bit later. So just to give you our perspective from the city of Imperial Beach and how dire the situation is for us, we're a very small city, much like our, our neighbors to the north, our coastal cities to the north, we're 26,000 residents and change, uh, we have a limited budget of close to $29 million per year. Most of our revenue is um, comprised by property taxes, sales taxes, and transient occupancy tax, which is basically the tax that visitors and tourists pay. With our beach closures being so consistent and pervasive, especially in the last couple of years, we have seen our economy be affected and depressed because our beaches, basically every single holiday last summer were closed. That included Memorial Day weekend, 4th of July, Labor Day weekend, when we have hundreds of thousands of people visiting our beaches. We are not seeing that anymore because whether you're a local visitor or an out of town visitor, why would you spend your hard earned dollars coming to a beach that you don't know if it's going to be closed? So it's, it's, it's something I repeat a lot in the media and I want to reiterate the urgency for this crisis for us and in Pearl Beach and now the city of Coronado cannot be overstated because our economy cannot depend two, four, eight years more of this. We used to have events uh, hosted during the summer months in Imperial Beach. We used to have summer concerts. We had Iron Man. We had surf contests. We have the dog surf contests. Um, you know, an array of different um, events that brought a lot of economic revenue to our small um, mom and pop shops in Imperial Beach. Those are all gone now. Our programs have been impacted. This is a photo of our um, last class of Imperial Beach Junior Lifeguards. They are now unable to access the coastal waters, of course, because they're impacted. Um, they are an important lifeline to our Imperial Beach lifeguards uh, for those that want to pursue that path. For others, you know, just learning life skills and ocean stewardship, it's incredibly important. Um, tool that is available to them. And we've had to cancel our junior lifeguard program that happened last summer. We're, we're really working with our partners to the north to figure out a way to host it in different locations um, on the bay side of San Diego. That's still being discussed, but just wanted to mention how severe the implications of this pollution are, right? We have an entire generation of youth from Imperial Beach that are off to college now that have known nothing else than this pollution crisis. Um, I want to mention that recently there's been an investment and effort from the Air Pollution Control District but from the county through a US EPA grant to place sensors throughout the impacted areas that have now um, confirmed with data what we've been hearing anecdotally from members in our community. Uh, that, you know, the stench is, is very severe, that they have nausea, headaches, um, some community members reporting even, you know, gastrointestinal diseases. So the Air Pollution Control District has placed uh, order sensors throughout these impacted areas. We have a couple coming online in Imperial Beach as well at City Hall and at the pier that have found that there's um, higher elevated levels of 
hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide, which are gases that are directly related to sewage. Um, their state um, thresholds or standards that exist for people who operate well, wastewater treatment plants that work there every day. Um, but there's no standards currently for long-term lower level exposures to these types of gases over time. So this data that's being collected will help us understand and hopefully develop those standards in the future. My hope is that we mitigate and remediate the, the source of the pollution first, but this is the reality of what we're experiencing in not just in Pearl Beach, but in Coronado and in South Bay, um, South San Diego County. Now, um, last year, uh, following Tropical Storm Hillary, which made landfall August 20. Second, I believe, um, we had our first ever boil water advisory in the city of Imperial Beach, something we've never experienced before. Um, it, it was pretty uh, devastating for our local businesses. We had to shutter every single one of our restaurants, bars, coffee shops, any food or beverage serving type of business had to be closed for four days. So our, our local businesses um, suffered dozens of thousands of dollars in losses from that boil water advisory, not to mention people weren't able to drink water from the faucet, which anybody of us can and should be able to do. Um, the reason why there was a boil water advisory is because a sample of drinking water tested positive for E. coli. And um, that storm brought a flow of the river of 7 billion gallons of flow in one day to our coast. So um, it was permeating everywhere. Um, so the fact that this sample that tested positive was the closest to the coast and the estuary, I don't believe is coincidental. However, that is still being investigated. If, if there was a direct correlation from all of the poo sewage pollution that was present in both the coastal waters and in the air. Um, Scripps Institution of Oceanography last year uh, published a study where they found um, that the pollution in coastal waters, once there's wave action and with the wind direction and activity of such, that sea spray goes out into the atmosphere and can travel well inland, sometimes even miles inland. And they have found genetic evidence that those aerosols can carry pathogens and viruses. So that's an area of further research that um, they're looking into that we are all um, supporting because we wanna better understand if there's a correlation with um, people becoming ill without even coming close to the coast or into contact with coastal waters. So just to um, also mention, uh, there's the nexus of um, climate change and sea level rise for um, that, you know, impacts us all, but especially coastal communities, uh, because we, as um, we had a presentation actually in this room from Scripps at our uh, Shoreline Preservation Group, as Scripps Institution of Oceanography has um, predicted, the models are showing that in 20, 30 years, we're going to have this type of coastal flooding, not just once or twice a year, but 10, 20, 30 times a year. And as coastal communities and cities are planning for, okay, how are we gonna adjust to sea level rise? How are we gonna protect our, our stormwater and drinking water supply infrastructure from corrosion, right? From saltwater intrusion. We're worrying about that and all of that water being absolutely obviously contaminated. As you can see, this is a photo of the uh, the street end of Seacoast Drive, which is a street that runs parallel to the beach. And on the east side of the street is the estuary. We had a King's Tide event. And this was um, what our streets looked like uh, after the flooding event, which obviously it's human waste in front of people's homes. This is what we are experiencing every time we have coastal flooding. So, um, 
that time when we had that flooding, when we had the tropical storm Hillary and the tested uh, the sample drinking water sample testing positive for E. coli, in that four block radius, we had an outbreak of E. coli and Shigella infections. Um, we, the city had several of the residents approach us and share with us their experience. One of the women actually had to be hospitalized. Uh, she had um, contracted Shigella, which is just another type of um, pathogen that is encountered in human waste and sewage contaminated um, water. So uh, she shared with us that she had to be tended to in her hospital room by nurses in hazmat suits. So um, that's obviously extremely concerning. Um, I just wanna reiterate, this is not something that we experience every day in Imperial Beach, but obviously it's something that no other community in, that I'm aware of in this state is experiencing. So what is being done? Um, we've, uh, in the city of Imperial Beach, uh, we declared a state of emergency uh, locally. The city council did that, and we continue to reaffirm that. Um, thankfully, Chairwoman Vargas and the Board of Supervisors have also declared both a public health crisis and a state emergency related to the sewage crisis. Um, the, the California Coastal Commission also prioritized this issue, sending a letter requesting the same of our governor and President Biden. Um, the state of California has um, issued a declaration stating that it's a federal matter, which we obviously agree this is a federal and state matter. So we continue to request a state of emergency declaration by our president. Currently, the state legislature um, already passed on the assembly side a resolution supporting funding, federal funding for um, the expansion of a sewage treatment plant and also calling on President Biden to declare a state of emergency. So that's in the works. So those are the things that we are asking um, that President Biden declare a state of emergency and uh, that we not just repair, but expand to double the capacity of the International Sewage Treatment Plant, which has not been uh, meeting Clean Water Act standards and is currently out of compliance. Um, and we also need to fund the second phase of that project, which is diverting the Tijuana River for treatment. And in good news is that um, last month I joined, um, I was joined by Mayor McCann from the city of Chula Vista and council member John Duncan from the city of Coronado. We um, traveled to DC and held, I think something close to 20 meetings with members from both sides of the aisle in both chambers that have key seats and appropriations and other committees. And I'm happy to report that um, Today, the House has approved a, not the $310 million request that President Biden asked for based on all of our advocacy, but $156 million to go towards fixing and repairing the International Sewage Treatment Plant. I believe it's right now, if not already, the Senate is also voting on it. So we expect that to pass. And what will that result in? That will result in us getting the repair and doubling of the capacity of the international treatment plant off the ground and going, right, on the project going. And on the Mexican side, just last uh, January, I believe, um, Mexico broke ground on the Punta Bandera sewage treatment plant that despite that being outside of our, you know, our nation's jurisdiction, it is six months south of, six miles south of the border it discharges between 30 and 40 million gallons of untreated sewage every single day and is the sole source of our pollution during dry weather months or during summer months because that's carried by the currents up north. So that's been a, 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 a significant priority for us at the city of Imperial Beach. We've been advocating for that to be fixed for a very long time. And we're very happy that Mexico has now broken ground on that project and they expect to have a completed project by September 30th. And the reason why that was accelerated 
was because um, President AMLO uh, prioritized it uh, and now tapped into their national reserves to fund it and handed over the keys to basically the equivalent of the, their Army Corps of Engineers. So we're gonna be watching that very closely to make sure that that's a successfully completed because that means that by next summer, with this plant being fixed, with our, the international treatment plant being uh, on its way to be repaired and expanded, we can begin to see a significant improvement in the pollution conditions that we're experiencing. So I think that concludes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Mayor Aguirre, thank you for uh, all your comments. I do have a, a number of comments. I'm sure some of our uh, committee members do as well. But prior to going to that, do we have any public comments, Francesca? Thank you, Chair. We'll start with the original draw and then go to Blair Beekman. I just wanted to say before my comments on the minutes were relevant, unless you didn't read the minutes then you wouldn't know. Um, yeah, this whole thing, I can't believe it's been, you know, 31 plus years since this has been going on, but just since you've declared a local emergency in Imperial Beach and you just waited till the end to say, because you said it's about their infrastructure, it may be, but they are releasing this water into the ocean and it's coming up our way. So that's important to acknowledge and not just say that it's like, the purpose of their, I mean, when you're intentionally putting wa that water into the ocean, it's it's not good. And then as you're talking about the diversion of the water for treatment, I mean, are you going to be giving back that to the people as far as like clean drinking water? Because we're giving people their sewage. And so, you know, it's funny when I said that as a joke, but if you're actually going to be taking that water and giving it back to people as pure water, that's a severe problem because you already know that it's tainted and you're going to be putting chemicals in it just to give it back to the people, which is totally toxic. So I, I, I don't really understand. Our next speaker will be Blair Beekman. You can go ahead when you're ready. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for this item. Uh, this is a long standing problem and issue. Um, Councilperson Moreno uh, is San Diego. Uh, she, uh, you know, San Diego just uh, presented their uh, one cent uh, sales tax proposal to put on the ballot this uh, November. It will compete with the county tax measure to uh, help fund items uh, and take away from a, an initial plan of a uh, bond measure for environmental concerns San Diego was working on. So uh, I'm sorry this is happening. <laughs> Basically, I mean, because what you're describing, uh, I was really looking forward to the bond measure uh, what that could have accomplished with uh, environmental issues that are so desperately needed for the whole region that could have been of help. Councilperson Moreno acknowledged this and was a bit concerned. Uh, she's she's totally wants to work towards these good things. Good luck in federal funding, how that can help, and that we learn to get behind this measure. Even as flood issues have happened, uh, we still can address uh, these sort of items if we do it. Thank you. Your time has expired. Chair, that concludes the public commenters. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, board member comments? Go ahead, Vice Chair. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I actually have one. Um, I, yeah, what's happening in your community is just tragic, and it's been going on for a long time. Uh, I grew up in the region, so I've been aware for a long time about it. Um, but uniquely, for the last 13 years, I, I've worked for Padre Dam Municipal Water District, so I'm actually very familiar with water, wastewater, reclaimed water, which Padre Dam had the first reclaimed water system in the country uh, back in the 50s. And, it's, and, and then I also ran Santee Lakes, which is uh, man-made lakes made out of reclaimed water. So I'm more familiar than most with this whole system and how it works. Um, my question for you is, uh, you know, I'm disappointed that you didn't get the $310 million. Is there a, a matching funds or it's since it's an international treatment center, what portion of the funding is going to come from Mexico? So I failed to mention that the reason why none of this can be funded locally as of now through bond measures or anything like that is because the International Wastewater Treatment Plant is operated by the International Boundary and Water Commission, which is an agency that's parallel to the Department of State. So all of the funding has to be channeled through the Department of State. Um, 
part of this appropriations bill language, they included some language to allow IBWC to be able to receive funding, not just from the Department of State, but other federal sources, including non-governmental funding, which is huge because, for example, we were un, well, not we, but the IBWC was ineligible to receive, for example, any funding from the Inflation Reduction Act or the Infrastructure Bill. So, to your question, this funding, yes, it's short what the 310 million request, original request was, but we expect that other half to come in FY 2025, 20, 2026. This will help get the project off the ground and started and not delayed any further. And that for us is key. We just don't want to see this delayed any further. So it will allow the project to continue to move forward and Hopefully with this new language, there could be some complementary funding from other sources. Now, Mexico has committed in 2022 through an, a binational memorandum of un understanding that they would invest $144 million in a list of top 10 priority projects, top of which was Punta Bandera. So they're investing a significant amount of money into these priority projects that ultimately, although they're in entirely in Mexico, will have a significant benefit for us here downstream in the US and eventually for their own constituents and residents. So I know that was a circuit, no, no. <laughs> a long way of answering your question, but I hope I did. You did. And okay. then I have a follow-up, and I don't even know if you can answer this, but last year at the Borders, one of the Borders Committee I'm meetings. I'm going to interrupt you real Sorry. quick. And and the reason why is our presenter for item four needs to leave at two. So we're hoping that she can present. And then she's quote unquote uh, authorized Mayor Aguirre to answer questions related to item number four. Okay. And this is uh, Professor Paula Stigler Granados. So if we could, because I also have some comments, so if we could hold off on comments so we can have items four presentation and then come back to questions uh, from this board as well as the public on three and four. Cool. Francesca? Okay, so I want to present uh, Professor Paula Stigler Granados from San Diego State University. I won't take more of your time. You're on. Thank you. Thank you so just, much. Just for the record, item four, public health report on exposure risk from contaminated water in the Tijuana River Valley. Thank you. Thank you so much. I apologize for the short presentation. Um, and um, uh, Mayor Aguirre, I hope, <laughs> I apologize too if I leave you holding all these questions, but uh, I wanted to just quickly give you an overview of a report. I think you all may have received it in the packet. This was a, a report that was commissioned uh, by the Prevost Foundation through Scott Peters' office to take a look at historical research that's been done, many of which by our faculty and students at San Diego State University and other local institutions at the different types of contaminants that we've been finding in the environment, and then do an assessment as to what types of exposure risks there are for our local communities. Next slide, please. So just a quick summary, this was not new research, it was previously published, and I did a systematic review of all of the different reports that have come out on the region, and some of the overall findings that we found were um, in the water, air, and soil, we found different contaminants like pesticides, herbicides, different types of um, hormones, flame retardants, all of these were in the water samples. Of those, several of these were organic chemicals that are persistent. They live around in the environment for a very long time, are of um, concern for human health as well as the health of our wildlife and marine life. And then also we found things in the soil like DDT and PCBs and heavy metals. And all of this potentially has uh, the potential to become airborne um, if it's blown up as dust. In terms of microbes and pathogens that we found, you know, we found really the, the things that you would expect to find in wastewater, um, including salmonella, vibrio, um, streptococcus, listeria, hep B, hep C, all of these uh, were not unexpected, but the number and quantity of what we found was um, uh, excessive based off of the amount of of pollution that's coming out. And then I guess more importantly, finding these antibiotic, antibiotic resistant genes, um, as we did this genomic analysis and sequencing, noticing that a lot of these were antibiotic resistant is a big concern for us in public health. 
I will have to say we had some limitations on the knowledge of those airborne contaminants. As Mayor Aguirre mentioned, there's been a very small study done out of Scripps um, UCSD that was looking at airborne uh, contaminants. And this is this next area that we're looking at. I just met with my team this morning to talk about what would be the next steps? How could we do additional monitoring and sampling and create a more robust uh, look at what could be happening? And I think our biggest issue right now is, is showing that water to air transfer and the distance that it could travel. So next slide. I think the next couple of um, uh, slides really just sort of illuminate what I just talked about, but I just wanted to bring up the fact that a lot of also what we're talking about with human health exposure, a lot of this is also zoonotic threats. So we have to think about our marine wildlife, how that affects our food chain, how our seafood could be contaminated as well. And again, I'll just go back to this idea that this uh, large amount of sewage pollution, urban runoff, chemicals, pathogens, it's just creating a, a kind of a, a really toxic soup of incredible amounts of pollution that again, being in public health, we think about exposure risks based off of quantity and the amount of quantity that is out there and potential for exposures are, are quite high. Next slide, please. So again, air contamination risks, this is really an unstudied pathway. Uh, we do need urgent surveillance. I'm very excited that the Air Pollution Control District has put out these monitors. Also, you know, the hearing that we're looking at the levels of um, of the smells that are coming off and how that's how that is being portrayed and how the environment. Um, I'm sorry, how the community members are seeing this, uh, and we hope that we can further that study by understanding a little bit more. A lot of our public health researchers and our toxicologists at San Diego State and our environmental health program believe that there is actual potential risk that people could be having these airborne depositions make it into their homes. And so we are hatching a plan as we speak to do some additional research on that to find out just how extensive is the contamination and how, how risky is it for our community members. Next slide. These were what I mentioned at the beginning with the soil contamination concerns. Um, I am thinking also about climate change. I think about our Santa Ana winds. So it's not just rainy seasons that we worry about with these flushes of huge amounts of, of contamination um, as the infrastructure isn't able to really handle all of the rain events. But I'm also thinking about the uh, continuous Santa Ana's and the increases in those dry weather conditions where we might see the dust drying up, everything becomes dust borne, um, airborne when that happens. And what types of chemicals are we finding out there that could be uh, people ingesting and, and inhaling? Next slide. Exposure pathways, contact, direct contact with water. We are all, I think, quite aware that that's a problem. It's very dangerous. That's why the beaches unfortunately have been closed. But again, this next level of looking at how is inhalation a potential exposure risk? And then again, this resuspension in the air of those contaminants, both pathogens and, um, and chemicals. And this is a very understudied area that we hope to address very soon. Next slide. Public health significance. So concerns about our at-risk populations. A lot of concerns are for our children, pregnant moms, our workers as an occupational health hazard. We have a lot of um, border patrol um, lifeguards, our Navy SEALs, especially um, military personnel, people working again in those mom and pop shops um, that are right there on the beach or near the beach in the coastal environment. A lot of people there are at a higher risk, um, have lowered immune systems. We also look at this as an environmental justice concern because these are areas where, again, this sort of um, level of contamination and length and duration of the contamination that's been going on would not be seen in other communities. And so we're approaching this also from that environmental justice lens. And then also we do have some new analytical tools, not cheap to operate these, but we do need to be able to use these in order to take a broader scope at, it's not just looking at E. coli anymore, um, but it's looking at some of the longer term exposures that we're concerned about. You have acute illness, but then you also have the potential for long-term illnesses that people you know, who are living with this and working with this on a day in and day out basis, um, that it's difficult to track. So we need to think about how we're tracking this and looking at this um, through that public health lens of a longer term exposure risks. Next slide. 
I think I already mentioned this, um, so we can go ahead and, and move on to the next slide. I think it might be the last one. Um, and I think Mayor Aguirre has already mentioned some of the next steps for the resolution. Um, having spoken with my team today, one of the things that we're very excited about the news uh, for the funding, and we're also thinking about now getting some baseline measures right now that are very, very important to ensure that once this infrastructure comes into um, into play, and I, I have faith that it will, I'm, I'm being opti um, optimistic and hopeful about this, um, and that we'll have those measurements to show improvements, mm -hmm. and that we'll also have some healthy baseline data to be able to look at people's health risks and see if, if illness levels are going down as a result of these repairs being made and the reduction in contamination. So I think this is going to be really good for our next steps to think about how are we looking at this long term, not just right now, but also how are we measuring this um, from the public health perspective, short term and long term. And I think that's all I have for now. Um, I'm at my one minute. I apologize. I can't hang around for questions, but you all um, have my contact information in the report that you have. And I'm very happy to respond to emails or come back and talk again um, further about those exposure risks as needed. Thank you for the information, Professor uh, Paula Stickler Granados. Uh, fortunately, I know you have to leave, but uh, we're in good hands with Mayor Aguirre. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, bringing it back to this dais. Uh, Francesca, do we have public comments on item four? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the original draw, you can go ahead. It's interesting to hear you guys talk because I feel like we exploit people that are, you know, suffering and have, you know, in, in been through disasters and different things like that. I mean, because obviously you want to know the health impacts, but I feel like we're sitting here and trying to collect data on things that you already know are affecting the people, you know, and putting odor sensors to measure things um, when you already know, like, again, that it's affecting these people and they're already sick from different things and they're, it is a public health threat. So, I mean, I don't know how much more data you need to collect. And then, you know, once you do, what are you, what are you going to do with it? I mean, I feel like everything kind of happens at a snail's pace to get things done, especially when this significantly impacts people. And it's all people that are there and, and anywhere near any of this pollution. But you also don't want to recognize that a lot of those things that you're finding in the water are from what they're spraying in our skies with the geoengineering and they are affecting the weather in that. But nobody wants to acknowledge that. You just want to pretend to fix the problem. If you do, then address that. And your next speaker will be Blair Beekman. You can go ahead. Hi, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, I had mentioned, my words got cut off on my public comment previously, uh, accountability. If we practice accountability uh, with uh, what's happened with the flood issues, uh, both pre-flood and post-flood, uh, I think we'll be in good shape. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be in a learning process together, and that's important. Um, Sandag is working really hard to create accountability with all of its grant fund measures. If you notice, they're doing that at their public meetings, bringing that together, making it a public process. Thank you. So we're getting our house in order to work for, towards a future of funding issues and grant funds. and. Uh, Good luck in the efforts. It, it's really important to be learning about this today. And thank you, thank you that it's here and that we're talking about it. Thank you. Chair, that concludes the public commenters. Thank you, Francesca. Bringing it back to this uh, dais, I cut you off, so I, I want to give you, uh, Council Member, the, uh, the, the dais first. Sure, thank you. It'll be quick. Um, you don't need to be quick. We're good. <laughs> One minute, no. Um, just want to make a comment about a presentation that we saw last year at Borders with the, um, it was a real estate developer in Tijuana and they were talking about the development of the sky. You were there. And so my additional concern is with that development, if they don't have- Infrastructure. Right. And, and it's, it's, they were talking about a lot of housing units. So just putting out the, even up. I don't know, do they collect development impact fees down there to mitigate this as they build? They can do accelerated building f f faster than we can. So I'm very concerned about that for all of us. I can give you my two cents, but I'll, I'll let Mayor Aguirre address it directly. Well, I echo your concerns. 
Um, it's very clear to me that our housing crisis is contributing to all of that development in Tijuana. We hear it all the time. The expat community continues to grow there. So yes, to me, it's concerning because the amount of infrastructure needed for that additional number of housing, it's 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 there in arrears, right? As we are. So it is concerning. I just want to mention that. And obviously you look at the housing prices in San Diego and you look at the housing prices over there, obviously it's usually two to one or three to one, uh, but the infrastructure is lacking to be able to support that uh, housing development that you go from one or two stories to 10 to 12 stories and from one to two families to a multifamily development. So it is unfortunately um, a very, very dynamic socioeconomic issue that affects both sides of the border. Uh, Vice Chair Chavez, you had comments? First of all, I want to thank Mayor Paloma Aguirre because you have been a true champion from the get-go of this issue and uh, congratulate you as well for the $103 million secured uh, from uh, Alex Padilla's office. It's, it's, he has proven that he's lending an, an ear to you for all these meetings that you've been knocking on doors in DC and everywhere. I mean, Chula Vista has been deeply affected as well. And not just Chula Vista, it goes to Coronado, it goes everywhere, right? Um, uh, I know you had a meeting with the a governor of Baja California, Marina del Pilar, not so long ago. Could you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, I've actually had several meetings with her. Um, she's offered to host um, the members that were present at the groundbreaking to have ongoing monthly meetings to um, get updates, regular updates on the progress of Punta Bandera. Um, her, her Secretary of Economy and Sustainable Development will be part of our panel this coming Wednesday. Everybody's invited. We're hosting a special city council workshop where we're gonna have him giving us the latest update on the progress of that project. So she, um, just briefly in my past experience working with past administrations, it's night and day the difference. Past governors have you know, said, well, there's not really an issue, there's not a concern. Well, whereas this governor, Governor Del Pilar has been very open and straightforward. Yes, this is an issue and we're gonna work on it. And so far she's, um, fulfilled all of the commitments that she has made. So um, we've had a pretty good working relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, the Secretary of Economy is Curjo Nor Morales, who was a former mayor of the city of Tijuana and who understands exactly what we're dealing with in, in Tijuana, Rosarito, and all the region. So that's music to our ears. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, since we have Gilberto Luna from the Consul General's office, Alicia Kerber. Um, I know we had a chance not so, um, I, I think like six months ago to talk to Can Canciller Alicia uh, Barcena. Um, and one of the issues did come up as the, the Tijuana River Valley um, issues. And I, I, I don't know if we have a follow up, but I, I think it's a great opportunity to talk to the new Consul General and maybe have the federal government have also, because Washington DC and Mexico City are so far from the border, sometimes it's really hard to communicate everything that's happening with the most transited border in the world, with the most, you know, all these issues that are happening, migration and uh, coastal and everything that's happening. But maybe if we can, in future meetings, send a letter through the Consul General. Uh, I know Paloma Aguirre, Mayor Paloma Aguirre, would love to maybe send a letter through your offices. So in conjunction with the Consul General uh, to Canciller uh, Alicia Barcena to be presented to uh, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs and then to our President of Mexico. <laughs> I hate to put you on the spot, Gilberto Pero. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to take, uh, thank the chair and the vice chair for welcoming our new boss. Indeed, we do have a new consul general, Ambassador uh, uh, Alicia Kerber, who is a very seasoned uh, career diplomat. Uh, she has more than 30 years experience in the Mexican Foreign Service. Uh, prior to coming to San Diego, she was our consul general in Houston 
And prior to that, she was a consul general in Kansas City. So she has a lot of consular experience. We're very pleased to have her join the team. And, and she indeed would love to, you know, she's very much looking forward to coming, uh, you know, to participating in Sandax uh, uh, meetings, both in the board of directors meetings and in the borders committee. Once she's settled in, she just arrived uh, three weeks ago. Uh, but of course, we will we'll, uh, convey convey that uh, that message to her. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now, regarding the Tijuana River Valley uh, situation, I would like to say uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, you know, of course, to uh, that we really appreciate the efforts of uh, Mayor Paloma Aguirre on behalf of uh, her constituents and Imperial Beach constituents uh, to make sure that both governments fulfill their commitments uh, entered in 2022. Uh, uh, in minute 328 uh, regarding the, the solution to the Tijuana River Valley situation. Uh, we really uh, uh, recognize uh, the hard work she has done, you know, trying to secure the funds for the rehabilitation of the international treatment plan. And we're very pleased to hear that uh, she, you know, she is in, in the way of success uh, towards that effort uh, with the approval in the house of $156 million. Uh, hopefully the Senate will approve it and, and this will become a fact. Uh, now, regarding Mexico's uh, side, uh, you know, I would like to reiterate some points that the mayor made uh, in terms that uh, Mexico is working very hard to comply with its commitments uh, regarding minute, uh, minute uh, 328. Uh, our government has committed, as the mayor said, uh, $144 million towards that effort, towards the projects uh, stated in this minute. And the most important of these projects is the a construction of a new wastewater treatment plant at San Antonio de los Buenos. This project is so relevant that it has got the attention of our highest authorities. It, it has become a priority to both the state and the federal governments in Mexico. Uh, so much so that uh, uh, last November, the president of Mexico and the uh, governor of Baja California uh, took this uh, this uh, issue uh, in, in, in the visit of the president to Tijuana, and the president instructed the Army Corps of Engineers in, in Mexico to take charge of the of the work, to get rid of the red tape and you know, start working on the, on the project of San Antonio de los Buenos. And uh, in January, the works began, and the, the completion of this project is scheduled to uh, be finished in uh, September of this year, before the president leaves office. So hopefully by the, the end of this year, we will have, you know, start to see the beginning of a solution to this uh, situation. That's basically. Thank you so much, Gilberto. And I just, again, want to thank you. This is a regional crisis. It's not just uh, Mayor Paloma Aguirre's or Chula Vista. It's, it's a regional crisis because when time keeps moving up forward, we're going to see it growing, expanding, and staying within the soils. And within, it's it's heartbreaking to see that we're boiling water. I had a friend in Imperial Beach that was going through that with a, a few, several small children, and it was just you know full time job coming down and boiling the water, boiling the water. What what she bathes her kids as well. I mean, it was just. A, a, a long process. Um, and I would also like to ask for consensus to agendize this issue at the future board of directors meeting. I would like to ask for consensus from this board, Hector, um, to see if we can recommend that the board of directors meeting have this on their agenda in a future meeting. And I would let that to your consideration and the chairs as well. You want to answer? No. Yes, we can we can hear the feeling of this uh, uh, committee, and as this was part of the resolution uh, twenty twenty four um, dash five that was approved in September of last year, so we don't have problem on on scheduling this. Yeah, we would be happy to transmit the um, will of the committee um, to agendize this item for the board at a future meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, you stole half my uh, half my comments, so I'll just uh, I won't regurgitate. I'll just uh, give you my second half comments. I was lucky enough to serve as vice chair of the Borders Committee a few years back when Serge Dadina represented in Pearl Beach, and he's very much a pro ocean dude. Um, and we had a lot of conversations related to the Tijuana River and something in my neck of the woods, which is the New River. Very, very similar situation. 
uh, raw sewage being dumped and flows northward because of elevations. Um, yours is dumped, or ours, because I am part of this group, is dumped into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, in Imperial County, it is dumped into what we call the Salton Sea, or affectionately called the Salton Sink. It is the same exact issue. It is raw sewage flowing north into a body of water. It causes significant health, environmental, air hazards, and um, it is an area that I'm very passionate about, which is public health. Um, one issue that was not, not touched upon and that I would love uh, the Borders Committee to be a launching pad for this um, and echoing Vice Chair uh, Chavez's comments is holding our bodies of water in Imperial and working with San Diego County with the Clean Water Act and holding that um, in this case, IBWC, International Borders Water Commission, and their equivalent in Mexico, SILA, to those specific water standards that every entity in the U.S. is held accountable for. So when water flows in, there is standard A for the Tijuana River, for the new river, and there's standard B, which is what every entity in, in California, in this case, the U.S., is held accountable for. So why, with all due respect, are we bastard children when it comes to the Tijuana River and, again, in Imperial County, the new river? So I would love for coastal cities, for the seven cities in Imperial County, for Imperial County and San Diego County to band together as a collective force when it comes to water pollution and how it is adversely affecting our community, our children, our health. And I think as a Borders Committee, echoing again Vice Chair Chavez's comments, we should bring it to SANDAG. We should fight it. There is a SANDAG equivalent in Imperial County, which is ICTC, Imperial County Transportation uh, Commission. Again, we should all be banded together for the same issue. And again, I, I can't reiterate this enough, it's the public health of our community. So again, this needs to be a launching pad. So I echo Vice Chair Chavez's comments. We need to be very forceful on this com on these on these issues. Uh, we have a mission to DC in Ju in June. We will be having this conversation along with lithium separate matter altogether. I'd love to talk to you about not today, uh, but again, water quality or water pollution needs to be at the forefront at everything at, as as a priority in everything that we do. So, Hector. I think uh, you have some marching orders from the chair, the vice chair of this committee as a whole. May I say something? Con mucho gusto. Thank you so much for that. And um, I can express how grateful I am for that proposition um, because it cannot be stated enough how, as you heard from Dr. Granados, concerning the public health ramifications and implications of this. This is beyond what the pro ocean surfer dude uh was carrying it's 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 been exacerbated it goes well beyond the coastal cities as you heard from dr granados it's not just about the gastrointestinal illnesses related to e coli it's carcinogenics it's toxics it's metals it's pcbs acetones you know the gamut in her presentation she had 392 chemical compounds identified um, in the samples taken from the tijuana river valley and as we speak right now there's hundreds of thousands of gallons of stagnant sewage water percolating all over the tijuana river valley and hundreds of thousands of plastics bottles and all other kinds of things that are just sitting there and not being cleaned up so the implications, like I said, go well beyond the coastal cities. So I'm very grateful for your suggestion, um, Chair and Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'll just finalize with this, and, and I know there's another item, so I'll be trying to be as quick. Uh, and I'll share something very personal with you. I have three children, three feet, three girls, ages uh, 11, 16, and 19. My 19-year-old uh, suffered from Hodgkin's lymphoma. My middle child, uh, who's in high school now, thank God, um, came down with Ewing sarcoma, completely unrelated cancer, and then subsequent to that, AML, which is quote unquote leukemia. So if if you think I'm not passionate about this, you better believe I am. Uh, I fully 
believe that th these are potential causes of respiratory issues and definitely of cancers in our in our in our mutual communities and that's what we need to fight and fight hard for for justice for our communities so with that um i think we've said enough on this subject before i start the getting into here or saying a few explicitives so we'll move on to item number five cross-border express update from jorge goito i apologize goito Ortua. Cross-Border Express. Bienvenido. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for hosting me. Thank you, um, Chair Jesus, Vice Chair Caroline, Carolina, and Hector, and all, all the, the members of, of the board. Um, well, just before I start, just empathize with uh, Major uh, Paloma on, on this issue. And I hope we can all, all everyone support uh, on this issue. All right, so we're gonna just uh, give you a brief uh, presentation. Well, it's not too brief, but uh, I'll, I'll make it fast about what's going on in CVX and what are our future plans. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, basically just wanna mention, right, uh, it's a unique asset uh, that provides a second airport for San Diego um, and connects all Southern California to, to Mexico. Of course, it has helps to, redu uh, to reduce congestion in San Isidro, Anotai, and really incentivize new travel um, thanks to this, uh, this facility. And I will show a little bit some a little additional numbers uh, uh, on it. So a few years ago when this project started, our vision was pretty much to really put together a safe and secure border to generate additional connectivity for the Tijuana Airport asset uh, and really to break barriers and modernize the, the way of crossing the border between Southern California and, and Mexico. Um, with that, uh, we put together, as you all know, a building in San Diego area, and with our partners of Tijuana Airport, also an additional building, a new building that today provides um, pr probably most efficient way to enter a country, uh, not only in our border and our region, but also around the world. Total process time is less than 22 minutes when you're picking up your luggage until you leave CBP in the in San Diego. And on the whole southbound process, when you access our e-gates in San Diego until you are accessing the boarding gates in Tijuana, it's probably 32 minutes. So pretty competitive uh, and, 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 and process. Um, today, um, Great infrastructure has been in, in place. We have worked quite a bit on development and um, and really expanding our parking options as uh, this CBP, CBX project not only serves the San Diegans, but also 45% of our, our users are really coming from the, San, uh, the LAX, uh, from greater LA community. So it really serves the whole Southern California. And with that, the Tijuana Airport has been able to expand to more than 40 destinations within Mexico. It's the most connected airport in Mexico above what Mexico City offers and adding more destinations uh, pretty soon. Also has provided opportunity to connect uh, to Central and South America, which is a great opportunity to create uh, jobs and bring more tourism to our region. Uh, many terminal services, but I just want to mention two things that we keep doing, and I'm really proud of it. One, we're still partnering with Champions of Health, and we still provide vaccinations for the population at CBX. And also, we have one of the few welcome centers from Visit California, which also uh, put uh, CVX on a very interesting context. Part of the success and our vision is also to provide great connectivity uh, in terms of ground transportation. Today, we have a couple of companies, or three companies, Los Limousines, Mexico, and International, uh, and we are expanding. We're about to launch a new service 
that it will connect uh, people all the way from Oregon and Washington to Washington State to CBX, right? And it's a little bit crazy to be <laughs> take a bus all the way, but it's still part of population who, who likes to do that because of the connectivity that uh, CBX offers. And um, and this project really has created a great uh, impact in our community. And just talking about the aviation sector, Tijuana International Airport prior to CVX was growing only at an average and component on a growth of 2% in the 10 previous year before CBX was open. After CBX opened, Tijuana was able to, to grow at 13%, which is pretty unique. Uh, not many airports in the world have that capability. And Tijuana Airport was one of the uh, top three airports who recovered from COVID. Basically, uh, in 2021, uh, Tijuana was already surpassing the numbers of 2020 or 2019. So that's uh that's that's really really good uh, and we have been able to create and as part of our vision was to become the preferred port of entry for travelers between mexico and california and uh just in, in seven years of our opening uh, which means last year we were able to reach that goal from the total uh, people that come from uh, Mexican air visitors who come to California, the whole airports. Uh, last year, CBX accrued for 50, almost 53% of the total Mexicans coming to any airport in California. From US or permanent residents in, the, in California visiting Mexico, we're also in the leading position of 37, 35% of the total uh, U.S. people visiting Mexico does that through through CBX, and overall, basically, CBX has been able to generate an impact of more or less 1.3, 1.4 billion dollars into our into our community. Uh, we have invested uh, heavily in in different projects, uh, including, of course, uh, projects of infrastructure, technology, uh, among many others, um, uh, expanding. Pretty much the terminal building, parking lots, uh, expanding uh, the the we are we are also able to complete the street uh, the street privatization, uh, street vacation. Now we take owner we take care of that and generate more uh, taxes to the city. Um, we have worked quite a bit on on wayfinding and and recently we installed forty. 300 solar panels to become a green company and generate our own electricity and and we're moving towards towards that as well so again really really proud of what we have achieved today basically uh, the total land that we have in cvx 168 acres uh, still a lot to develop in in uh, not only in the terminal building but um in, in the whole land that we have today. Uh, Tijuana Airport has really invested more than $300 million in the last five years to modernize the airport. This is a new facility that hosts all CBX passengers in, in Tijuana, uh, 420,000 square feet uh, building that it's also ready to have in, in transit uh, area, which means that if the Mexican authorities approve a passenger going into international flight out of Tijuana could be able to do so without doing double immigration, meaning double immigration in Mexico and the United States. Um, so that's already in, in progress. And yeah, many things to, to come. First of all, our vision is to reach from 4.2 million users that we ended up in 2023 to 8 million users by 2036. And with that, we need to invest heavily in infrastructure technology um, to be able to offset. And we will do the same in, in Tijuana. Uh, how are we going to do that? First of all, keep incentivizing the traffic, finding new audiences, bringing new flights. And I'm happy to, to, um, to let you know that San Diego will be connected to China uh, pretty soon. Starting uh, on March 17, there's going to be a flight from China Southern that will connect 
Tijuana and San Diego um, heading only heading uh, west um, to Guangzhou. Uh, this flight will operate two times a week, starting in Guangzhou, Mexico City, and then to Tijuana and going back to, to China. And starting in July, uh, Hainan Air will connect our region as well with um, Beijing two times a week. So great opportunities uh, for for the for the community on, on these new flights. Um, our, we need to keep expanding, as I already mentioned. So our our, our really our, our vision is is to invest in different projects in that short term, uh, central path enclosure, uh, departures, grab and go, um, arrivals at the equations area, uh, food and beverage expansion area uh, with different concepts uh, in order to really not only serving our travelers, but as you all know, the Thai Mesa community has been growing and there is new housing uh, uh, in, in the area that we, we believe can be served by offering more food and beverage options uh, in the near future. So there are some pictures there that exemplifies what I, I'm, I'm already saying. So um, I just want to pretty go pretty fast and respect respectful of, of your time. So this is our what we will be at the expansion of the terminal. And in the midterm vision, of course, we remain committed to open a hotel and multi-use building where we can have conference room, where we can have uh, additional features for the community and for our travelers. A uh, new QTA, which is a, a um, um, building that pretty much the car rentals uses to, to make their process more efficient, car wash, uh, all changes, et cetera. And of course, we're working uh, with the community, the Thai Mesa and the city of San Diego on the expansion of Siempre Viva, which will allow to connect uh, the, the Thai Mesa east and west uh, through, this, through this avenue. Uh, so many projects, again, on the, on, on, on the, on the timeline, uh, as I already mentioned, as we span in the next few years, the food and beverage area, the second phase will expand further food and beverage area, uh, a ground, ground uh, transportation center, and more car rental uh, facility. All of that generates revenue for the city, generates uh, tourism stays in hotels. Um, and so basically we're, we're really committed to keep expanding. And why not? In the long term, right? Uh, of course, we will need to further expand our terminal, isolated the departures and arrivals uh, uh, as we envision these eight million passengers, and and hopefully the extension of the trolley that I know it's in the Sandak radar. So uh, we're ready to host all of that in the next uh, few years. Last but not least, I just want to mention um, that we uh, been. Uh, growing and engaging much more with the community. Last year, we were able to raise and fund or, or, or give to different foundations more than $200,000 in, in, uh, in different projects. This 2024, uh, we're targeting for almost $350,000. We will sponsor um, the, uh, the World Design Capital, uh, we'll partner uh, further partner with uh, UCSD. Uh, so four pillars on this, uh, education, health, youth, youth um, that uh, definitely impacts our, our community. And also, uh, as I hear a comment, uh, pretty soon we will, uh, uh, we're already partnering with a foundation that is called Freedom, Fundación Freedom uh, from, from Mexico, who is uh, basically, um, uh, working towards the human trafficking. And um, it's very, very happy to say that uh, in this effort, we will not only be partnered with them, but also Mexican immigration will be part of this effort, as well as the Mexican consulate here in San Diego. So with that, I just want to thank you. I think I went a little more fast than I expected, but uh, I want to be respectful of your time and happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Goy Tortua. Yeah. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, that's all good. Mi disculpas, mi disculpas. Don't no worry. Not even in my phone they pronounce it well, so. <laughs>
Francesca, public comments? Thank you, Chair. We have two public comments on this item, the original draw, and uh, who will be followed by Blair Beekman. Dang, the willful ignorance that goes on with just boards across this county is, is insane because you're just talking about the Mexican immigration. You know that they're helping facilitate the invasion on our border. They're, in fact, they're telling the people that are coming across to go south and that they can't go north at the time so that they stagger the influx in people. And then you're talking about having safe and secure border. That is anything but what's going on. And you don't want to acknowledge it because you guys have all of this, you know, business that you're doing with Mexico, which is, like I said, the extreme and trafficking going on is also another business that's happening with them. But you're blatantly ignoring the fact that that's going on so that you can push all of these agenda items. And it's really sad. I mean, you're even talking about champions for health and providing vaccines. Those are genocide shots. It's another willful ignorance that is happening. Nobody wants to acknowledge that these are killing people, right? But the more that you ignore the facts of what's really going on and engage with the same people that are invading our border and helping it happen, you guys are complicit. Uh, our next speaker will be Blair Beekman. You can go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, I take to heart what... Uh, the DRA has been talking about uh, these sort of uh, border issues for a few weeks now. Uh, I think uh, for ourselves to address trafficking issues, it can be a very important matter and, and actually work towards how to better understand better uh, immigration issues at the border overall. Uh, I, I think that uh, an open border policy and the policies that Sandbag works towards with Mexico has been something close to awesome to me. It's a way to really establish uh, that friendship and camaraderie can work together uh, in how to address our issues instead of using fear and paranoia. And uh, good luck that you can continue those good efforts. And what I'm hoping a new CEO can continue with the previous CEO offered. Thanks a lot for the work of this item, what, what was talked about. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> so that concludes the public commenters. Thank you, Francesca. Bring it back to the Stias, uh, Vice Chair Chavez. First of all, I want to thank Jorge Goytortua for taking the time and honoring us with this presentation. I had the honor of breaking ground with CBX, being in the first, uh, the grand opening with CBX and the topping off ceremony at CBX. And the first idea when I was working for the city of Tijuana and I was working for the Commission of Binational Affairs they were presenting in 2004. And so I go way, way back with CBX. And CBX is, is a solution to many, many issues. Remember that we have, we have the most transited border in the world, and that represents tons and tons of contamination as well. So by CBX opening its doors, it's getting all these cars, all these wait times off our streets. So solutions like this, investments like these is what we're looking for. And I hate to say it again, but regional solutions. We're not an island. It's not San Diego. It's not Tijuana. It's a region. And we have a floating population that goes back and forth. Either we want it or not, look for it or not, we need it. So I, I, I thank Jorge Goitortua again for, for coming uh, to this uh, committee and sharing this experience uh, because it's an incredible model of when of seeking out collaboration of all levels of government between two countries, which is very, very hard to achieve. And you have done it so flawlessly with 3.2 million users. I know your project that is 8 million, but that's just astonishing. And Again, going back to the tons and tons of pollution that we're getting and cars that we're getting, the carbon footprint off the streets, it's just that alone. These are the kinds of projects that as a board, as a committee, that we should be seeking out to partner up with. So congratulations. Gracias otra vez por venir, Jorge. Gracias. Comments, council member, mayor? Good to go. I will make a, uh, primeramente, si sí, con respeto Jorge, porque pues el apellido como que si no se me pega y no quiero insultar. So with all due respect, I'll call you Jorge. Gracias. Um, 
there, there's a word in 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 Spanish that uh, loosely translated is basically awesome. Chingón, super chingón tu proyecto. Yes. Entonces, felicidades. Uh, I have personally not utilized it, but I've had family members and friends. And the only individual that has spoken somewhat, and I say this candidly, somewhat is obviously parking. But anybody that uses an Uber, a Lyft, or any type of uh, public transportation is is infatuated, to say the least, on both the individuals crossing the border heading south and vice versa heading north. So congratulations on, on, on your project. I think any time that we talk about goods movement, or in this case, people movement, uh, that is that is uh, positive, that is done effectively, efficiently, and legally, I think we should not only embrace it, mm -hmm. but fully support it. So hats off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on to item six is adjourn adjournment. Before we adjourn, any agency or comments from uh, from the dais? Saying none, I don't know when we have our next meeting scheduled for, but I'm sure uh, our partner in crime, Mr. Vanegas, will uh, definitely share that with us so we have it scheduled. For your next meeting, uh, we are preparing an, an agenda that uh, will be addressing the San Isidro Mobility Hub. We are also planning on bringing a report on SB 617 is confirmed. And we are also managing to bring other topics for that. And my vice chair just pulled my ear and said that our next meeting is scheduled for Friday, April 26, 2024. And um, as a point of order, our vice chair, and obviously it was definitely supported by everybody in this diocese and myself included, uh, making water pollution a priority when it comes to the Sandag Board of Directors meetings as well. With that, the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Have a great weekend.